Good afternoon. You remember that when we came to London this trip, that it was suddenly without previous notice and that no arrangement had been made for any work over here. I suppose we might have imagined that I was going to have an idle time vacationing. But as you have seen, places were provided for us for lecture and classwork, and many opportunities have been given to us for these uh, smaller groups of our own long-time students. And so this uh, period has passed with a great deal of work, a great deal of our coming together and with a result far greater than you know about at the present moment. Meanwhile, we have also had the opportunity of being in Munich and Berlin and Frankfurt and Germany and watching the opening of our work there since some of the publications are in German. And it was really a beautiful thing to see how in the different cities and even in some of the smaller communities that the word of this message is spreading. The remarkable thing is that even after a year of the German publications, that by far most of the active students were working with the English edition of the letter and the English publications. In other words, so far, the word has gone mostly to those Germans who speak some English. And uh, we had far less contact with just those who had only the German publications. But in any event, <coughs> the uh, work is opening there beautifully, and it was more than satisfying. But I want to go back for a minute to this. When we left Hawaii to go to California, it was for a two-month trip. And then we were to return to Hawaii. But instead of that, there was something operating in my consciousness that just would not permit me to go home. And so uh, I might really say that I took advantage of excuses not to go home, but to go here, there, and the other place. And probably if there weren't good excuses, I might have made some here and there. But actually it was so that we didn't go home and that we just kept going from city to city without any previous arrangements for work and until we got to New York. Well, then I ran out of excuses and there was no reason not to go back home. And... I suppose I just had to say to Emma, well, don't you think it'd be nice to visit London for a week or two as long as we're this close? We're really only a puddle jump away. So we jumped the puddle. And as you know, also with no previous work. And so the answer to this is just this, that inwardly I was being nudged or plagued with something that wouldn't come out something that wouldn't come to the surface. And uh, I couldn't go home and be quiet because it didn't seem to me it would come that way if, in fact, it was going to come. And so we just kept traveling. Well, I want to tell you that it came Friday night. You have it all. Certainly, when I went up on that platform, I little dreamed that anything like that would come forth. And even now, I, I can't believe that it came out. But it did, and it's what I've been waiting nine months for. It's what's been trying to get born. 
And the reason that I know it so surely is that I've had my peace ever since. I can go home any time now. I won't because we have promised uh, work in Sweden and Holland, and we'll certainly go there and complete it. But at least I am at peace, and I'm at peace because the Friday night message came through. You see, it was a very difficult thing for the master to tell his followers that my kingdom is not of this world. This world is the only world they knew. The world of Roman domination, the world of the synagogue, the temple, the world of the farm, of trade, it's the only world they know. And there was no hint in their teaching that there was any other world except the one that you expect after you die, but that there should be another world, another kingdom here on earth that is entirely outside the belief of the human. And yet, he was trying over and over again to let them know about this kingdom in many different ways. I have bread the world knows not of. This is the bread of a different kingdom, a different consciousness. I can give you water, living waters. How? You have no bucket to draw with. But you see, he was speaking of water of a different world, of a different consciousness. In my father's house are many mansions. Now, the Hebrews knew nothing about mansions, most of them. They were hard workers. And yet here he is talking about mansions, many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Go where? They were expecting him to go to Jerusalem and overthrow not only the temple, but Rome as well. But he wasn't going there. And when he got there, he didn't do any overthrowing. In other words, they were expecting that he would overthrow one temporal kingdom and present them with another temporal government. And it isn't any different in our day when uh, the people are, on one hand, trying to overthrow the temporal kingdom of communism, the communists are trying to overcome or overthrow the temporal kingdom of capitalism, and uh, probably both of them are hoping to replace it with a temporal kingdom somewhat better than the one before. And that's about as high as the human mind can go, giving us a better temporal kingdom, giving us a better or healthier temporal body. The human doesn't go higher than thinking in terms of a healthy body instead of a sick one, a young one instead of an old one, an active one instead of a passive one. In other words, we're always thinking in terms of that which we already know. We do not have the capacity to visualize that there is something beyond what we already know, just as it is only recently that we have grasped this idea of space and now find that it is possible to go into a realm, even an earthly realm, beyond the one that has always limited us. As people were limited before 1492, limited so that they could not cross that ocean or the oceans. And that limitation was broken down. And uh, the limitation of crossing a continent on horseback or with a horse and carriage. 
limitation after limitation has been broken down, but every single bit of it in the temporal realm. So it is that those who have caught glimpses of the kingdom that the Master was speaking about have always tried to tell us of a spiritual kingdom, of a spiritual state of consciousness in which there are different values, in which there are even different forms. As we came into the metaphysical age, if you go back to its old literature, and even some of its new, you will find also that the whole mind was merely on changing one temporal form for another, the form of disease for the form of health, or the form of lack for the form of abundance the form of lonesomeness for the form of companionship, the form of homelessness for the form of home, unemployment for employment, but every single bit of it on the, in the temporal realm, every single bit of it in the world of effect, merely trying to have a better effect or more of an effect. Now, with mystical teachings, we try to lift ourselves into another consciousness, a fourth dimensional consciousness, a spiritual consciousness, a Christ consciousness, so that we can begin to behold these mansions that the Father has prepared for us, these mansions that the Christ prepares for us, the Christ consciousness goes before our human self and then lifts our human self up into it. We quote, my kingdom is not of this world. We quote, I have meat the world knows not of. We quote, I am the bread, the wine, and the water. Have we even the faintest idea of the meaning of those, or do we believe that they refer to the temporal kingdom? I know some do, of course, because I receive letters of complaint about my statement that we mustn't pray for things when Jesus prayed for daily bread. I know that we are trying to take a spiritual teaching and bring it down to the level of our human experience instead of dying daily to the human experience in order that we may be reborn of the spirit. You see, the master was clear on that and Paul saw that. John certainly saw it, that unless there is a dying to the human sense of things, there cannot be a rebirth into the spiritual reality. Now there is another kingdom, a spiritual kingdom, and no one will ever see it while their mind is merely on exchanging uh, a bad material condition for a good one. No one will ever behold the spiritual kingdom until they can learn that both the discordant human experience or appearance and the harmonious human appearance, that both of these are <coughs> illusions of the five senses. No one enters the kingdom of God just by being a healthy human. No one enters the kingdom of God even by being a good human. The Master clarified that for us for all time when he said that our righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees and there was nobody more righteous than they. Or when he said that the least spiritual of you will enter the kingdom of God before John the Baptist who was already the greatest of the Hebrews. So you see that to reach 
the spiritual realization of being, it is necessary that our thoughts ascend above merely trying to change our human surroundings or conditions and begin to have a little of that longing to know God, whom to know a right is life eternal. All the way back to our textbook, The Infinite Way, you will find references to the fact that health is as much of an illusion as sickness, and that we must rise above the belief of health the same as we do above the belief of disease. We have to even rise above the belief of life as far as we have to rise above the belief of death. Because life and death in the human scene are just opposite ends of the same stick. They have both have beginnings and they both have endings. And as long as you're merely thinking in terms of preventing death in order to have life, it means that even if you succeed, you're merely postponing it. It is only when we stop thinking in terms of life and in terms of death and, began, and begin to think in terms of our immortal, eternal, incorporeal being that we will discover that life which is life eternal. Now here comes one of the most difficult points in the message of the infinite ray for almost every student for a long while. We speak of beholding God because of the sun and the moon and the stars and nature. And this can easily be misinterpreted. There are people in the world, they are called nature mystics, who believe that God is in nature, that God is manifested in the sun, moon, and stars, and the flowers, and the plants, and so forth. But you know that isn't true. There isn't a word of truth in that. All that we behold with the five physical senses are creations of the universal human mind. They are in no way divine. They are in no way spiritual. They are only our limited concepts of the spiritual. It is for this reason that you can have disasters in nature. If God was in a tree, a tree wouldn't die. If God was in the ocean, uh, there wouldn't be a storm in it. If God was in the wind, aha. Uh -huh. See how long ago that was known that God is not in the whirlwind. God is not in the storm. God is not in the phenomena of nature. All of this represents the second chapter of Genesis, the creation of the Lord God or mind. It is only when you see the sun, moon, stars, and nature, plants, rivers, vegetables, so forth, when you begin to see these as merely symbols of the real, or the human concept of the real, that you begin to perceive that behind this creation there is this my kingdom. My kingdom, a temple not made with hands. Once you perceive 
that there is a spiritual kingdom not made with hands eternal in the heavens you will then know the consciousness that we must be lifted up to before we can behold reality in other words then while we are down here merely trying to change this human picture even though we may succeed in making it a very pleasant one temporarily nevertheless we have not yet touched the spiritual realm now the master would never have given the world this teaching had he not received it from within uh, the master did not make up this teaching he did not invent it it isn't alone that he said this message is not mine but his that sent me it isn't alone that he said uh, I come to do not my will but the will of the father it is only that the lives of the mystics have shown us that what he said was true and that they perceived it some of them in small measure and some in great measure and so it is that today we know that this is a revelation that comes through it must come through from some place and because of its uniform nature and because it always comes with good there can't be any doubt that it comes from God as you know if there are any of you who do not know it you will know now that I hold Mrs. Eddie in the highest light for her revelation and for her work and I'm going to call your attention to a passage in her writing that shows that she glimpsed this she said the day will come when we must overcome the insanity of help it's only a sentence out of thousands of pages but it shows that somehow or other this vision came through to her a momentary vision one that's probably lost in all the vast writings but there it is she didn't make that up that was seen that was glimpsed that someday we must overcome the insanity of health in other words isn't it insane to make ourselves perfectly healthy today in the knowledge that a germ tomorrow some wrong food tomorrow an accident tomorrow a bomb a bullet can destroy it all doesn't it, it show what uh, folly it is to spend a lifetime merely trying to get a healthy body or a few extra dollars or pounds when any blessed thing in this uh, universe can upset it in a in an instant remember I'm not uh, setting aside the joys and benefits of abundant health and abundant supply I'm talking about the fact that our time can well be spent in bringing forth the spiritual awareness of health and supply a permanent one an eternal one not one made with hands or human thoughts but the one that is divine and so throughout these writings infinite way writings you will find that right from the beginning this has been the major vision that has kept me going this idea of incorporeality this idea of not treating disease to get rid of sickness and get help not taking human footsteps to bring supply when the spiritual sense is permanent and so of course the uh, class of Friday night to me is the culminating experience of my spiritual life the climax because it came out into the open it came out in uh, 
a whole hour of pouring. It isn't just a sentence here or there. It's an entire presentation. And uh, with all of the spiritual visions that I've had within myself before on this, this is the first time that it came through the voice in uh, a complete lesson. So you know that to me it represents Another plateau. Oh, I think somewhere on this trip earlier I spoke of plateaus. We go from plateau to plateau. Well, this represents to me another plateau, a higher plateau, probably the highest we may attain. Certainly it'll be the highest unless we reach that one and discover that there may be still one beyond. But we're not going to go beyond until we've accomplished this one. As you read the writings now, you will see that this has been the major principle in all of the writings from the beginning. But you'll also find that this is the first time that it has been given to us in plain ABC. Not only what the vision is, but how to attain it. How our daily practice must be what our daily practice must be, how we are to train ourselves when these appearances are brought to our attention. But I must call your attention to this. You'll find this all through the writings, but you'll find it indelibly given on Friday night. Remember that in the old metaphysical days, we denied the reality of evil. But remember, you are not in the infinite way until you are not only denying the reality of the evil appearances, but denying also the reality of the good appearance. In other words, the good weather must be seen as only the opposite of bad weather. Both of them physical phenomena and therefore not of the nature of reality. So it is that you must behold the physical health. Not as if you had accomplished something great, but actually as much of an illusion as the ill health. It may possibly be next month that some of our students may be shocked. I don't know if it's next month's letter or the one after, in which you'll find it stated that we grieve at funerals, whereas we should much more grieve at birth. And the reason, too. Now, it isn't that there shouldn't be a world and a world of people, but there shouldn't be a world of mortals. There shouldn't be a world of people born to die, born to wither, born to war, born to slavery. What profit do we have in children coming into life merely for the sake of living a brief span and dying. And it isn't necessary. Because with spiritual vision, with the understanding of the real nature of God's universe, we will have a world of people right here on earth. But the Master told us that as in heaven, so on earth, God's government would reign. And God's government is not sin, or disease, or war, or death. This world that we would enjoy through spiritual consciousness would be a world of harmony, but not the harmony of today and the discord of tomorrow. The harmony of God, which is eternal. The life of God, which is eternal. We would not have four billion people each believing themselves to have uh, 
a life of their own, or as we read in yesterday's paper, that the only solution to our problem today is not only wiping out many of those who are on earth, but being sure that more don't come to earth. Well, you know, that idea is uh, as fantastic, preventing birth, as it is destroying life. Because that can't be the solution. In the kingdom of God, there can't be a solution that involves either death or interfering with the processes of nature. That can't be part of God's kingdom. That's man's distorted mind. That's the ignorance of the human mind that cannot go beyond the limitation of what has heretofore been known. There is an answer. Just as there was an answer to uh, bringing forth health where there was discord, just as there is an answer to lift, lifting people out of their former slavery into the democracies, so there is an answer to this problem of world population. But the answer doesn't lie in temporal means any more than the answer to these world problems of today, international problems of today, exist in temporal things. Have you felt in the last few days that there is a break in this tension and pressure over Berlin and Laos and so forth? There is. There is a definite break in the pressure, in the temper, in the tension, and uh, there is no human reason for it. But there is a spiritual reason. It too will come to light. If you start with the smallest problem that comes to your attention, and if you work faithfully with it, you will overcome it. And as you are willing to undertake greater problems, more vital ones, more serious ones, you'll find gradually that you'll overcome them too with your spiritual awareness. And so it will only be a matter of time until you can see, well, if the Wright brothers could fly 57 seconds, I can understand why we can fly a thousand miles an hour. They first had to fly 57 seconds. I can remember, and some of you can, when Blériot received uh, 5,000 pounds for flying 26 miles across the English Channel. We have to pay now to ride 3,000 miles across the Atlantic Ocean. We don't even get paid for a 3,000-mile flight. Why? So just in our little span, we have gone that distance between thinking of 26-mile flight as something great to thinking of a 3,000-mile flight as just a part of the day's uh, livelihood for a pilot. Now, you find the same as you come into the spiritual work that it seems almost an impossibility to help somebody with their problem. There's that feeling of not knowing how, not having the power, so forth and so on. But gradually you learn that it isn't a matter of power. Healing isn't brought about by power. Healing is brought about by your awareness of the unreal nature of appearances, not only discordant appearances, but the harmonious ones. That is really the spiritual healing principle. It's not bringing God power into this world. It's not somebody who is specially ordained to heal the sick. No, whatever God does for one, God does for all. It's a question of whether all are willing to pay the price. And in spiritual healing, the price is the ability to control the emotions so that they do not react to appearances, so that we do not get uh, shocked at the most horrible appearances and we do not glory too much in uh, the uh, health that we see restored. 
that we accept it as the natural part of our understanding, the same as uh, the architect builds a, designs a house and knows that that is the natural result of his understanding of those laws. A pilot pilots a plane and he doesn't go around looking for medals every day. He knows that that is the fruitage of his understanding of that particular thing. And so it is. Spiritual healing is the direct result or fruitage of our ability not to respond emotionally to the appearance world. Our ability to understand that if you can see it, hear it, taste it, touch it, or smell it, it is not of God, therefore dismiss it. Don't try to improve it, heal it, change it, or correct it, or enrich it, but dismiss it in the understanding that there is a spiritual kingdom which is the real. And it isn't observable to the finite senses. It is only back in your awakened spiritual consciousness that you know that there is a spiritual kingdom here on earth, right here on earth. We do not go any place to find those many mansions. We do not go any place to find my kingdom. And why? Because it isn't low here or low there within you. It's no other place than within you. And what you realize in consciousness becomes evident in the experience of all those who touch your consciousness and many who never know that you are on earth. In other words, you will undertake work on the spiritual path because some one or two or three will invite you to do it and thousands will be benefited by it who do not know whence came the blessing. It has happened many times, I have it in my mail repeatedly, where someone was present where there was an intoxicated man and uh, eventually the man came up to the student and said, thank you for praying for me, I'm all right now. And there was no outer evidence that that individual was praying or knew how to pray. It happens over and over again that animals we have helped, the moment they see us come running up to us, even if they have never seen us before, because what the Father sees in secret is shouted from the housetops. In other words, yes, going back to the Master's, uh, that we do not have to pray to be seen of men and we don't, do not have to give alms to be seen of men because what we do in secret appears as demonstration outwardly. And so it is that if we gave all of our benevolences without anyone ever knowing that we gave it, still the fact would be broadcast in the world. Still the fruitage would come back to us. Why are we not at all? Because it's spiritual. And uh, we cannot always see how the spirit operates, yet makes itself known. As you study the writings, begin to notice again now how many times it is brought to your attention that it is our reaction to the appearance that determines the outer circumstance. Notice how many times it is brought to our attention that we are dealing not with conditions but concepts, mental concepts. And when they hit up against the truth, the concepts dissolve. They disappear just as light. Coming into the room dissolves darkness, yet it doesn't dissolve it because there isn't any such thing called darkness. And I think since Friday night you will understand now why it is said that to God the dark and the light are the same. Anything that is of a physical nature 
whether it's negative or positive, evil or good, is the same in the eyes of God. It's just illusion or nothingness. When both ends of the stick are recognized by us as being neither one real, then we can say the same thing. Sickness and physical health, darkness and light, sin of purity, they're all the same. They're all mortal illusion. They're all nothing. They're all the dream. And our recognition of that brings about what in human language is called healing. And then somebody says, I feel better, or I've had a healing, or so forth. But it isn't that. It isn't that an evil condition has been changed to a good one. It is that the entire material scene has dissolved, and the spiritual harmony has been brought to life. Again, do you see why, in the Master's teaching, so much stress is placed on the word I? I will never leave thee. I will be with thee to the end of the world. I am the bread, the wine, and the water. I am the life and the resurrection. Always trying to bring to our attention that the reality, the substance, is within us, not outside to be attained. The appearance world would say that our good is external to us and must be attained, but the spiritual revelation is that whatever it is, and this is a quotation from the infinite way, that which I am seeking, I am. All that the Father hath is mine. The I of my being is really the source of my existence. In other words, then, why react to this outer human scene? Why react to the evil appearance or the good appearance when our task is, through an inner vision, to perceive that the secret of life is within me? The secret life is in the I that I am which is the I that you are, and that's what unites us in a spiritual bond, that we are of one household, we are of one Father. Call no man on earth your Father. And you see, the moment you turn to the mind, that becomes ludicrous, doesn't it? That we all have one Father. It's ludicrous, because we live thousands of miles apart, and my father never was where you were. And my father is white, and somebody else's father is black. See how ludicrous the moment you try to translate truth into human terms. But uh, there is a way for each one of us to, to spiritually discern the fact that our human parents are not really the creative principle of life, that the creative principle of life goes far back before our parents or grandparents or great-grandparents or anybody else's. The creative principle of life is one, it's spirit. All else is an emanation of that spirit. Therefore, there is but one Father, and because there is but one Father, we are of one spiritual household. We are united in a spiritual bond. I don't know how many centuries before Christ there were schools on earth teaching the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. It has always been known to the mystics that there is one father, one household, one family. And uh, once we begin to live from that standpoint, we'll find that we don't have to stop children being born and we don't have to kill off those that are here. You find there is plenty on earth for us to share with all those who do not have. And what we have to share will be multiplied over and over again. We don't multiply by withholding, we multiply by our outpouring.
then I would say this to you, that what this trip has brought forth, this trip to England, what it has brought forth in accentuated form, and uh, in a larger form, is one of the most basic of the infinite weight principles, and that is how we are to react not only to the evil appearances, but to the good appearances, so that we prepare ourselves to receive the spiritual picture as it is. Not keeping our vision on changing the evil to the good, but once we have seen the evil and the good as human illusion, mortal illusion, carnal illusion, then the attitude of, all right, reveal to me spiritual reality. Thy grace is my sufficiency. Not health is my sufficiency, not abundance is my sufficiency. Thy grace, thy grace that reveals to us our spiritual selfhood. Now you will note as you go through the writings again, the hundreds of references to the fact that there is but one selfhood. One selfhood, and it is spiritual. That's a denial of appearances. There seem to be thousands of us. But there is one selfhood, regardless of how we may appear or who we may appear to be. One selfhood, and that is the spiritual selfhood which I am and which is the embodiment of my good, which is in fact the eternality of my existence, the incorporeal spiritual existence which I am, coexistent with God since before Abraham was, since the beginning of time. And an English mystic once said that even before God was, I am. Yes, I have existed before there was a concept of God, before anyone thought it necessary to look around for a supernatural something to do something for us who are already incorporeal, spiritual, perfect, harmonious, eternal, and all the rest of it. Do you not see that only in people's humanhood that they have to invent gods, they have to invent superpowers to do something for them that is already being done, that is already their natural state of being. Now, it doesn't take some kind of a super god to be prayed to just to stand still when an appearance presents itself and say, I cannot accept it because it is not of God, and then witness harmony appearing. Then you wonder, what about all these billions of prayers that have gone up to God to restore somebody's health and you say to yourself, no wonder they aren't answered. The God they're praying to is a man-made God, an image in their thought, a human concept, and they're expecting this human concept to do something. There is a God, but to be aware of God, it becomes necessary that the mind be still, that we be receptive and responsive, and then let that which is God reveal itself. But begging isn't going to do it, pleading isn't going to do it, Bri tithing, bribing isn't going to do it. The only way to know God is to be still and know that I, in the midst of me, am God. Be still and know that I am God. In quietness and confidence, be still, be still. Let God reveal itself. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. And then hear, hear, listen, 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 until we hear. For the kingdom of God is within you. And that is where it has to be discovered, and that is where it has to reveal itself. If you don't find it at first seeking, you have to go back again and again, and deeper and deeper, until it is reached. Now, the spiritual wisdom 
that has come to us through all the ages has come from within the consciousness of those mystics who are attuned to receive it. You can see that the attunement comes by our ability to have these periods of inner listening, contemplation, meditation, quiet, whatever it is that will enable us to be so still that the voice can come through and be heard. Whether it's heard orally or merely sensed isn't the important thing, but that something can come through to us from the within. The periods of quiet, the periods of meditation, can be short ones, but they must be frequent. Because in the, these meditations, a vacuum must take place, an expectancy for something that we know not. Not something we know, but something that we know not, something beyond our ability to know it. So that when it comes, it can come with a message that would startle the world, but for which you have prepared yourself. By the very act of meditation, you have prepared yourself for anything that might come through. And nothing will come through then of any nature beyond your ability to grasp because it is the degree of your capacity to receive that determines what can come through. Probably in the same way that a one-inch water pipe won't admit anything more than one inch of water. And so it is that our capacity to receive determines the depth of the message that we receive. And as our capacity grows, so does the depth of the message grow and the richness and ripeness of it. So that it is the greater mystics that bring to earth the greater spiritual wisdoms. Whether or not we have any desire to bring through the greater wisdoms is of no importance. As a matter of fact, I don't believe anyone can have such a desire. The desire only is to instruct me insofar as I can receive it today and show me how to utilize what instruction is given to me. One grain at a time is enough because it multiplies itself. But remember that what we read in the books serves as the inspiration that takes us back within ourselves and enables us then to receive from the same source that the mystics received from. Develop our own capacity for greater awareness. It's really the most important work there is on earth. It's far more important than anything else can ever be because from this comes the illumination that ultimately can save the world that we know can't be saved in any other way. There's too much destructive power on earth today to believe for a moment that it can be saved unless this spiritual nature comes through and brings with it the wisdom of the ages and the love of the ages. Well, we still have a few more meetings together in case the Father has anything more for us to hear and uh, say good night. Thank you.